All right, this is going to be the first of the substantive Kant lectures. Uh, it's going to get pretty thick, so remember you could use the closed captioning and you can replay these videos to your heart's content. Uh, but let me say, overall, the first reading and this video that corresponds to it is answering the big question, why be a Kantian? And if you bear that in mind, it will help kind of ease through some of the rest. So first of all, remember the Kantian descriptors we already introduced. Kant is a rationalist rule deontologist. Taking them backwards, something about the act itself has intrinsic value. What is it about the act? The rule being followed. Where do these rules come from? They are derived from pure reasoning. So they are like math. So we're going to take this in a few steps, um, but we're going to start with why I think uh, that ethics is, can be, or should be pure. And this is what I told you to look out for uh, with the argument about the merchant or shopkeeper, depending on translation. And it's a really important argument, and I wish Kant would have put it in like giant 30-point font and bold and what have you but it goes through pretty quickly in the readings if you're not paying attention. So to emphasize the importance of this argument uh, for the rest of the course, we will call it the really important argument, or TRIA for short, because all this stuff that's gonna seem counterintuitive and strange later is derived from this argument, it's derived from TRIA. So, start with the example. What is the example? Uh, Kant says, imagine two situations, not one, but two. So there is a case in which uh, somebody comes into the shop and the merchant has the opportunity to overcharge this customer. And now introduce two cases. In case one, the merchant doesn't overcharge because it would be wrong to do so. In case two, the merchant doesn't overcharge because he's afraid that word will get out that he overcharged and it will hurt his business. So notice in both cases, the action and everything that follows from the action is the same. Neither case is overcharged, but uh, here's, what's concept, here's what Kant says. Are those cases morally different? The merchant doesn't overcharge because it's wrong. The merchant doesn't overcharge because he's afraid it'll hurt business. If you say, yes, there is a difference in those two cases, that one case is somehow better than the other, or one case is somehow worse than the other, then Kant's gotcha. And let's explain why. So this will be the formalization of the argument I call tria. Uh, start with cases like Kant. So premise, take any two cases in which all circumstances are the same, and the only difference is intent. So the, the merchant case is like this. Well, what the merchant did, the action, was the same. Uh, everything leading up to it is the same. Everything after it is the same. The only difference is the one part of the action is the merchant's intent. The intent to do right versus the intent to help himself. So, again, premise one, take any pair of cases that's like that. And then ask, are those two cases different morally? If yes, if you answer yes with any of these cases, uh, two results follow. Uh, and we'll talk about those results in a minute. But let's just give a few more cases. So I rush into a burning building to save people because it's the right thing to do, or I rush into a burning building because I want to be viewed as a hero. I, I join Big Brothers Big Sisters because they need the help. I join Big Brothers Big Sisters to meet girls. Uh, these are the cases we're talking about. Well, everything is the same except intent. In both cases, I run into the burning building. In both cases, I uh, join Big Brothers uh, to go. Since we just came off a singer kick, you know, I. Save the kid from the from drowning in the pond because it's right versus I save the kid from drowning because I'm expecting a reward. Um, all the circumstances are the same. Whether I get the reward or not is the same. My action is the same. The only difference is intent. So premise one of TRIA, think of any of those cases like that. 
All the circumstances are the same, the act is the same, only intent is different. Now ask, is there a moral difference? Is there a moral difference in overcharging, um, or I'm sorry, not overcharging because it's wrong versus afraid it'll hurt business? Seems to be. Is there a moral difference in saving a life because it's right to do or saving a life because I'm expecting a reward? It seems to be. But if you say, yes, those cases are morally different, then Kant's got you because that establishes two conclusions. Conclusion one, the circumstances did not matter to ethics. How can we conclude that? Because the circumstances were the same and the ethics were different. Hence, it's not the circumstances that determine the ethics there. But the second conclusion is that intent did matter to ethics because the only difference was intent and yet the morality was different. That means the moral description follows intent. And so put those two together. Circumstances didn't matter to ethics and intent did matter to ethics. That means we could add a few descriptors here. If you grant Kant that argument, you've just said we should be absolutists about intent because intent is the only thing that mattered there. So the only establishes absolutism. But also since the circumstances didn't matter, that means facts about the world are irrelevant to ethics, hence establishing that ethics needs to be in his, per, in his parlance pure, independent of empirical concerns. And so that's where everything else in the Kant comes from, that really important argument or trio. So now we know why he's a deontologist, because it's intention that matters to ethics. And now we know why it has to be pure, uh, because the circumstances simply did not matter to ethics in those examples. Um, so everything is going to go back to that argument. Everything that might seem extreme or counterintuitive later You've already granted Kant in saying that those two, those two cases were different. Uh, but let's say a little bit more about the difference in those two cases, because, because Kant has some really important insights here. Um, first of all, he's going to distinguish these, all these pairs of cases are differences in what he calls mere conformity with the moral law and for the sake of the moral law. So those are your two categories, mere conformity and for the sake of. And notice the word mere is logically important. It means only. So if I refrain from overcharging because I'm afraid it hurts business, I'm not doing anything wrong. I shouldn't be overcharging. And so I am conforming to the moral law, but I'm only conforming. I'm not doing it for the sake of the moral law. So for the sake of the moral law would be refraining from overcharging because it is wrong. And all those pairs of examples we gave, you could distinguish between mere conformity versus for the sake of the moral law. Now, let's say a little more about this. So first of all, an insight we briefly talked about way back in the Nielsen days that we see explicitly now, things that are done in mere conformity of the moral law have no moral worth. Uh, Kant's really important insight here is that actions done solely for the sake of prudence, for self-interest, are not morally valuable. Um, so, and that's what all these cases are. I'm doing something that helps me. And, well, everybody helps themselves. That doesn't make it ethical to do so. And so the things that are in mere conformity for the sake of the moral law are not of moral value. Now, did we do anything wrong? No, we're still not breaking the moral law. And, but we didn't do anything right either. So using our terminology from unit one, Kant would say that things done in mere conformity for the, of the moral law are neutral. And whereas morality lies in what is done for the sake of the moral law, which Kant says is our duty and is our obligatory. So that's an important distinction. Um, we're going to have to say a lot more about the moral law, and we're going to do that a lot in the second video. But uh, this is an important moral insight. Uh, but let, let's practice a little bit. So Kant is going to say, in his terminology, the goodwill, not just any will, but the goodwill 
is what he calls an unqualified good. So what do we mean by that? Uh, first of all, Kant is an absolutist about intent, as we've already mentioned. But that's like saying absolutist about consequences. There's good and bad. So when we're evaluating any action, Kant's just going to say, well, what was your intent? Tell me about your intent. And that's going to be where the moral evaluation lies. Uh, we started to establish that from Tria, but now let's draw out the importance of the unqualified goodwill. Uh, Kant has already decided and argued, I should say, that what is moral is independent of circumstances. And so when we ask the question, what can be good independent of circumstances, Kant's going to say the answer to that is the goodwill. So take yet one more example. Uh, suppose I see someone choking, I go apply the Heimlich maneuver successfully, save the person's life. And you might ask, well, what was good about that? Well, the consequences were good. I saved their life. That's awesome. But was there something else that was good? Sure. I intended to do the right thing. Now compare that with another situation in which I see someone choking, I attempt to do the Heimlich maneuver, I fail, and the person dies. Um, the consequences of that action are not good. They, the person didn't live. But nevertheless, was there still something valuable there? Kant says, yes. The fact that you were trying to do what is right still has value. So that's what, he, that's what he means by saying that the goodwill is an unqualified good. It is good regardless of outcome. The fact that you were attempting to do right is going to have value whether I succeeded in saving the life or whether I failed. So that is... Uh, that is exactly what Kant is looking for. He's saying, what is good independent of circumstances? The goodwill. And so we have uh, this certain qualifi qualified version of intent as what we should be absolutist about in terms of value, independent of circumstance. So uh, notice we're not going to be able to just leave it at that, because if we say, all right, I'm an absolutist about intent. Well, how does that work? Um, oh, I see someone drowning in a pond, so I'm going to sit at the edge and just will the good at them. That's not going to do the job. So instead, we're going to have to talk about um, what specific willing has to be done in order to perform our duties. And this is where Kant introduces the word maxim. Kant's definition of a maxim is a subjective principle of action. And you say, wow, that's so complicated. What is that? Uh, it's something of the form, when X, I will Y. And if you will notice, uh, that's exactly the same definition of a rule we gave when we, de when we defined u rule utilitarianism. Yeah. So when Kant says maxim, think rule uh, in the sense we used in the last unit. Now you say, wait a minute, shouldn't those be different? Yes and no. Um, so Kant is a rule deontologist rather than a rule consequentialist. What does that mean? Both agree that we should be evaluating the rule uh, as a way to evaluate the action. The difference is the basis of evaluation. So the rule utilitarian will say the value of the rule is in the consequences of the rule and is therefore extrinsic to the rule. Kant says no, some some rules just simply are of value, and we evaluate actions based on the rule, period. Whether the rule is good or not is independent of consequence. So if we want to be more precise, yes, Kant is an absolutist about intent, but he's really an absolutist about which maxim you are intending to uphold in your action. So let me say that again. Uh, Kant is an absolutist about which maxim you intend to uphold in your action. So ultimately, we are going to need to evaluate maxim. Not as bad as you might think, given that we already have the groundwork laid out here with uh, knowing how to formulate those maxims in terms of rules. So far, so good. Um, here's the part that could get a little slippery. How, uh, we've, we've tossed around this language of the moral law, but 
let's pause here and draw out what needs to be true of the moral law in order for Kant's system to operate. So Kant already argued through Tria that morality has to be pure and independent of circumstance. Which means we have to be talking about moral law rather than moral rule. What do we know about laws? They carry necessity and are universal and are pure, that is, independent of experience. And when you put all that together, that's what Kant means by moral law, capital M, capital L. And you might say, well, wait a minute then. How many moral laws are there? Trick question. The answer is exactly one. There is one moral law for Kant, hence capital M, capital L. Why? Because such a moral law would have to be universal and carry necessity. That is, it therefore must be binding on all times, or sorry, at all times, on all people, in all circumstances, must abide by this moral law and must act out of reverence to that law. As such, and here's the weird part, it has to be, in essence, contentless. It has to be, uh, because once we start describing content, we move from something universal to something merely hypothetical. So if I try to give the law content by saying, don't murder, uh, that only applies in certain situations. I mean, you should never murder, but at the same time, you're not in a position to murder. I'm home alone. I can't murder. Uh, and so that doesn't apply at all times and all places on all peoples. And so as soon as we try to give content to the moral law, we actually make it so it's no longer universal. It is for this reason that another word for the moral law, according to Kant, is the categorical imperative. You'll hear that a lot. Um, so it's categorical in that it always applies, and it's imperative that it's something we always should do. So some, uh, some things only apply in certain times and certain places. So you should not belch in polite company is what Kant would uh, calls a hypothetical imperative. It only applies in certain situations, whereas the moral law can't be like that. It must be binding on all time, on all people, at all times, in all places. So how do we do that? The moral law in and of itself has to be without content. Once you start adding content, you turn it into a hypothetical imperative. Well, how then can we act according to it? Simple. Uh, we just have to make sure our maxims, our subjective principles of action, are in accordance with it. That doesn't actually require us to articulate the moral law, because we can't. So our topic for next lecture is going to be ensuring that that happens. How do I know whether my maxim is in accordance with the one and only moral law, the categorical imperative? And to answer this question, to fulfill this role, Kant introduces what are you called the formulations. So think of a formulation like a formula. You plug certain variables into the formula that spits out an answer. So we plug in a maxim and it spits out whether it's in accordance with the moral law or not, i.e. whether it's permissible or impermissible. So that's what the formulations do. They are, form they are formulas that allow us to figure out whether our maxim is in accordance with the moral law or not and is therefore permissible or impermissible. Kant has five or six formulations uh, for the categorical imperative. Uh, I, it's not that I don't know, it's that scholars are split as to whether two are actually the same one or not. Uh, so there's five or six. The class is responsible for two on the final exam, so you might want to do some Googling and make sure you can find these in the, in the next reading before you do it. The first one is called the formulation of universal law, and the second one is called the formulation of humanity. Uh, these are, uh, so make sure you can find those in the next reading, but again, big picture, think of what they do. Kant's ethics has to be pure, he has argued by Tria, which means we have to think of intent in terms of what would apply independent of circumstance. As such, we can't give content to the moral law. Instead, what we could do is test whether our own subjective maxim is consistent with the moral law or not, 
And in doing so, we can determine whether our act is permissible or how to do that. Watch the next video.